leisure one minus L, and here is the number of coconuts that they eat, and they're going to have some indifference curve that looks like a Todd Douglas indifference curve. And then what is the firm going to do? Well, it's going to have um, it's going to have a uh, linear uh, production technology. And therefore, it's going to set that equal to the price. And the consumer will choose this point here. If the firm had not a linear production technology, they would have a thing like that. And they would just set that tangent to the uh, prices, as we showed uh, in the previous <coughs> lectures. right? And so the, the optimal point from society's perspective are where these two things are tangent to one another, but that's exactly what the market does. It forces everyone to set everything tangent to the prices. So all the marginal rates of transformation are set tangent to the prices, and all the marginal rates of substitution are set tangent to the prices. Okay. The only problem that can arise is when equilibrium fails to exist. Uh, and this can be a problem when either supply or demand is discontinuous. So a um, simple example of this is imagine that demand was just linear. Um, so it just looked like that. Uh, but then imagine that there was a firm that could only produce either one or zero units of the good, and that the cost of producing the one unit is one dollar. Um, so then, the if this is uh, if this is quantity, the, the consumers are willing to pay uh, two dollars, right, for one unit, and uh, the maximum price. Sorry. At a price of zero, they're willing to buy one unit. So this is one down here. And they're willing to pay up to $2 uh, for the first unit. And the firm can only produce one unit or zero. So its supply function is just is like uh, that and that, right? So there's no intersection between this demand function and this supply function. Right. The firm, for if the price is at least one dollar, will produce exactly <coughs> one unit, and will produce nothing below that. And the consumer has this linear demand, and there's no intersection between these because there's this gap in the demand function. I mean, in the supply function, right? And we talked about this a little bit last time. You know, what happens if demand doesn't cross supply anywhere? Well, imagine that rather than there just being this one uh, consumer and one firm, imagine that there's a hundred firms like this and a hundred consumers like this. So again, then the consumers' uh, demand would look like, would look the same. But now, rather than there just being this one firm that produces like this, there could also be you know half of the firms could produce, right? And half of them could not produce. So at any point spaced evenly each one hundredth along here, there would be a point that would be consistent with the supply. Right? And then that would make it much more likely that there would be an intersection between the demand curve and one of these points on the supply, because it could be halfway in between, or there are 99 out of 100 firms could supply, or 90 out of 100 firms could supply, etc. And so eventually, as there get to be a lot of firms, this becomes a line here rather than just a gap. And then there becomes an equilibrium between supply uh, and demand. Um, so the basic point is that as long as there's a large number of firms and consumers, even if they have sort of weird supply functions and demand functions, there's always going to be an equilibrium. Um, and in practice, yeah. Go ahead. Um, like in your last lecture, you talked about how like that isn't necessarily the case because 
Yes, that's 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 right. But the the point I wanted to make is that as long as there's a small one firm that makes a big deal, then we should be thinking that it's more like an oligopoly or a monopoly, right? Because that firm has a big effect on the market price. To the extent that we're going to have perfect competition, there better be a lot of firms and a lot of consumers. And so you only run into the sorts of problems that we were talking about if you're trying to use perfect competition to think about a situation that you shouldn't be using perfect competition to think about. So really, cases when like the equilibrium doesn't exist, that's an indication that either you left out of the model what you should have included, which is that there are more firms, or that you're using the wrong idea to think about equilibrium. You really should be thinking about oligopoly or monopoly, not about perfect competition. So what that basically says is non-existence of equilibrium is not something where you're like, oh, my prediction is that in the world there's no equilibrium. That's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is, if my model says that there's no equilibrium, that means I'm using the wrong model and I should go back and re-examine my assumptions. It's almost like reaching a contradiction in the model. It says you don't uh, really, you haven't really modeled things in the right way. Okay. Yeah, so I can just redraw what I was saying. So, um, If again the consumer demand looks like that, and the firms, each individual firm is willing to produce zero or one, as there get to be a lot, so as we first have two firms, then we could have either both produce zero, both produce one, or one firm produces one and one produ firm produces zero, and then we get an equilibrium. But more broadly, if we then got to three firms, well we could have you know, one firm producing, two firms producing, or all three. As we got to be four, we would get these <coughs> points. Five, we would fill it in. You see, and as we get more and more, we fill this in more and more closely. So the amount by which we fail to have an equilibrium gets smaller. And as we get to have a very large number of firms, it's completely filled in, and we always get an equilibrium. Okay. So, um, uh, the basic idea that we want to add in this class is what does production, rather than just exchange and consumption, add to the benefits from trade? Um, and Eric Bejarano, uh, could you, it, how is it pronounced? Be, Bejarano? Or? Um, Bejarano. Um, what, uh, what is like the main thing that the possibility of production adds to what can be gained from trading? So under consumption, it was just I like candy, Maria likes uh, like or I, I like foie gras, Maria likes candy, and we can trade between us. But what what additionally can happen in the case of production? Yeah, so Maria might be good at you know, raising ducks, right? And, but I might be the one who wants to eat the foie gras, right? And I might be good at manufacturing candy, but she might be the one who wants to eat it, right? So uh, what can happen is, for example, Brazil is much better at growing sugar than it is at making computers. So in order to grow one ton of sugar, uh, they probably would have to use about the same amount of resources that it would take them to make one computer, let's say. Whereas China is much better at making computers than at growing sugar. There's like nowhere to grow sugar in China relative to Brazil, right? And so to produce one computer, it would take about the same amount of resources that it would take to uh, produce one-tenth of a ton of sugar, right? Now. That means that China has what we call a comparative advantage in producing computers compared to, uh, compared to Brazil, whereas Brazil has a comparative advantage in producing uh, sugar. Now, that's even true if China could produce, because they've got more people, more of everything, right? So China might be able to produce, say, 100 computers or 10 tons of sugar, 
whereas Brazil can produce eight tons of sugar or eight computers. So China can clearly produce more of everything, but in relative terms, they're better at producing computers than they are at producing sugar compared to Brazil. So then, if you put the two countries together, they could produce 80 computers and 10 tons of sugar. That's one thing that they could do, right? If China produces 80 computers plus two tons of sugar, and Brazil produces eight tons of sugar, right? Um, on the other <coughs> hand, alone, if they wanted a ratio kind of like that, each on their own, they would be able to produce much less. So China could, say, produce 50 computers and uh, five tons of sugar, and Brazil could produce seven uh, computers and one ton of sugar, and together, they would only have 57 computers and six tons of sugar. Whereas if they combined their efforts and had, you know, Brazil focus on producing sugar and China focus on creating computers, they would have uh, 80 computers and 10 tons of sugar, right? This is very analogous just to the issue of candy uh, versus foie gras, right? If China is better at producing some things and and Brazil is better at producing others, each should focus on the things that they're better at producing. Similarly, if one person enjoys one thing more than another person does, then each of them should focus on uh, consuming the thing that they enjoy. Um, so, uh, uh, he Sun, yeah. uh, could you draw a picture of uh, the comparative advantage in this case? So like we could put on the vertical axis, uh, we could put sugar here and we could put computers here. And then maybe you can draw the two graphs then. Yeah, sure you can do two graphs. have a line, right? Because they can, so China can produce either a hundred computers or ten tons of sugar. Yeah. So that's China. Brazil has to be producing less of everything, right? But they have to be better at doing sugar. No, they can't produce very much computers, right? They've got to be able to produce very little computers. But they then produce more sugar, right? Yeah. Well, less of sugar than China could, right? But they're better at producing it than China is, right? And then what can they produce together? some of these two things together, right? <coughs> but then, and they can do the Chinese trade-off, right, in terms of producing computers until they get all the way out here, right? And then they have to use the Brazil uh, trade-off to produce more computers beyond that point. And so the point is that rather than having to follow either one of the countries, they get this extra amount, which is bowed out like that, because they're able to use the more efficient uh, way of producing at each level, right? Um, so, uh, while international trade benefits everyone uh, overall, it can hurt individual people within countries. So. Let's think about um, the farmers who grew sugar in China and the manufacturers who make computers in Brazil, right? Uh, even though overall the countries are better, uh, you know, if initially the price 